Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Sometimes we've done things one way for so long, it's all that we know. And we need to throw ourselves open to the word of God and say, God, I don't care what I'm used to or how I normally do things or how the world does things. I want to know what you would do in every situation. And I want the grace to follow you because I want the life that only you can give me. Well, we've been talking about uh, how to handle temptation and just want to make the point again that when you feel tempted, feeling tempted in and of itself is not sin. And I think for <clears throat> many of you, that may be the most important thing that I've said this weekend because temptation must come, the Bible says. We're going to be tempted. You might be tempted to lie. You might be tempted to worry. You might be tempted to steal. You say, oh, I would never be tempted to steal. Well, let me ask you a question. How many office supplies have you brought home from where you work? Ah, <laughs> oh, well, we won't, you know. <laughs> Do you teach a Sunday school class and you take all your papers to the office and run all the copies on their copy machine? And anyway, we'll just move right on past that, so. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the thing is, is there is conviction from God about those things. We just make excuses. Well, everybody else does it. Well, they don't pay me enough anyway or, you know, whatever the thing is. And so, you know, I know that we think that we would never lie, but how many times do we tell people we're going to do something and then we don't do it? Oh, I'll call you tomorrow. No, we don't do it. Yeah, let's go to lunch next week. I'll call you. And even sometimes when we say it, we don't have any intentions of going to lunch with somebody. And so we need to realize that some of these things are what we might consider little foxes. But it's little things that often open up the door for much bigger problems in our lives. And I think that we need to live carefully, not in fear, but carefully, really making an effort in the power of God to really follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We have options. We can live a low life or we can live a high life. Today, the title of my message is called The High Cost of Low Living. God offers us the high road, the higher life, one worth living, one that is without regret at the end of it. I want you to think about that. To me, I think one of the saddest things in the world is to see somebody that's elderly, that is now at death's door, who looks back over their life and they have nothing but regret. I saw that with my own father and it was extremely sad. He was mean and abusive and negative and sour. And he was born again at the age of 83 and I'm grateful for that and I know that he is in heaven now. And uh, I'm grateful that we had the privilege of leading him to the Lord and he was finally able to repent. But you know what? He still died, I know, looking back over his life and being filled with regret. He didn't really have that many people that even cared anything about him. And I just want to say to you sincerely today, start living your life today in a way that will not leave you at the end of your life with nothing but regret. Don't get old and then sit back and think, well, I wish I would have and I wish I wouldn't have. Every day we're faced with choices Every day we're faced with options. And I want to say to you today, stop letting somebody else make all of your choices for you. Joshua said, you do what you want to, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I really feel that I want to say again, if you're doing this, stop letting other people make your choices for you. Don't live under so much people pressure that you keep all the people around you happy at the expense of giving up the life that you could have with God if you would be willing to say no to them and yes to the Lord. Always remember that those people will not be the ones that will give an accounting for your life. Each one of us will stand before God and give an accounting of our life. That doesn't mean that, you know, we have to be fearful 
I just think that we need to be wise about what we do with the resources that God has given us. We all have resources. We have time. What do you do with your time? We all have a certain amount of finances. What do we do with our finances? We all have a certain amount of talent and abilities. What do we do with those? I think that it's very important to bring before people on a regular basis the power of choice, the power of right choice, and the power of wrong choice. In Matthew 6, verse 24, it says, we cannot serve God and mammon or deceitfulness of riches. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever else is trusted in. Why does the Bible so often refer to money as deceitful riches? It's not that money is not a good thing. It is. We all like money. We all need money. We all want money. There's nothing wrong with that. But it does have a deceitful property in it. It makes you think that it can give you joy. It makes you think that it's so important that it's worth making all kinds of other sacrifices for, even mistreating other people or compromising your spiritual walk just to have this money, and it really does have a lot of deception in it. We need to always put God first and let God give us what he wants us to have, which will be much more than we could have ever gotten on our own. Now, let me say that again. The devil wants you to think that if you serve God, you're going to lose out on all these other wonderful, fun things. I'm not going to say that serving God doesn't require some sacrifice. It does. But I can promise you this, and please don't ever forget this. Whatever you give up for the sake of the kingdom, God will multiply back to you many times over, and you will end up with more than what you ever gave up. Don't ever forget that. Let's look at Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and all of his own interests. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? And take up his cross and follow me. Now, the cross that Christ asks us to carry is not a wooden one that we get on and suffer in the same way that he did, but the cross that we are asked to carry is to live unselfishly in a way that God can work through us and we can actually be a blessing to other people. Look at me while I tell you this. You cannot be selfish and happy. I said you cannot be selfish and happy. It's not possible. And it's very conceivable to me that there could be people here today or people watching by television that you are just so unhappy and you think if you could just get that promotion at work, you'd be happy. If you could get married, you'd be happy. If you weren't married, you'd be happy. If you, know, if you had a bigger house, you'd be happy. And I can almost guarantee the root cause of your unhappiness is probably selfish, self-centeredness. Don't throw stones at me. I had to receive that same truth from God in my own life. I was a selfish preacher, <laughs> and it's not a good combination. Amen? Selfishness just makes us miserable. God hasn't called us to inreach. He's called us to outreach. Actually, the more we try to make ourselves happy without any thought for other people, the more unhappy we become. You can increase your joy immediately today by just walking out of this place, getting your mind off yourself, and asking God to show you who you can be a blessing to. Amen. Now he says, Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, this life right here that only lasts for a certain amount of years, his comfort and security here shall lose it eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here for my sake, shall find it, which is life everlasting. Now, when the Bible says that he gives us life, actually, when you receive Christ, 
not only do you enter into you're never really going to die, you're just going to pass out of this realm and you're going to pass into another realm and live for eternity, but God gives us life, and the life that he gives us is the quality of life that he has. It's not just a breathing life, but we actually have the Zoe of God, the life of God on the inside of us. And if we can learn how to care more about that than we do everything that's going on around us, wow, can life ever get amazing. It just is tragic to me, all the people who are born again and who go to churches and who, who read a little bit of their Bible and they may even serve in church, but they're just not happy because they don't really understand that you can't have God and all the other things that people have in the world. Now, I'm not saying we can't have the things that people have in the world, but there will be some things that you and I both will need to say no to in order to have all of God that we want to have in our lives. And I can tell you're real excited, but it'll get better, I promise. <laughs> Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what would a man give in exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom? So I, I want to say this to you like this today. Whatever your choice is in life, you will pay a price for it. If you choose the kingdom, and the kingdom means you choose a walk with God. You choose to, to not only just say you believe in God, but you, you choose and I choose to live a life here on the earth that honors and glorifies God. If we choose that kingdom life, it will cost us the world. If we choose the world, it will cost us the kingdom life. So I think that we're living in times where maybe those of us who minister the word need to make things just a little bit clearer because Jesus is coming back soon and we need to be living a certain kind of lifestyle that will honor and glorify him. And please don't look, like, look at it like, oh man, another message on what I need to give up. Please remember, anything that God puts his finger on and says, this is not good for you, then it is not good for you. And if you release it to God, he will bring something else into your life that will be so superior to what you think you sacrificed. You know, it's amazing how sometimes you can have things that are just so bad for you, but it's the only thing you've ever had, and you're so used to it that we don't even have enough common sense to lay that down for the better thing. It's amazing how many years I was full of bitterness and hatred because of my father sexually abusing me, and I didn't even know I had an option. I didn't even know it was possible to totally and completely get over that. I had bought into the lie. Honestly, I just believed that I would always have an inferior life. I mean, I thought I would always have a second-rate life that it was too late for me. Well, that was a lie, and because I believed it, that was what I had. But man, in Christ, I found out that I had options. But now listen to me. In order to have God's option, I had to give up the bitterness, the resentment, the unforgiveness. Well, at first, that was hard for me to do because I was used to that. That was my way of getting the world back for what it did to me. I wasn't hurting the world. I was only hurting myself. So honestly, let me say again, sometimes we've done things one way for so long, it's all that we know, and we need to throw ourselves open to the Word of God and say, God, I don't care what I'm used to or how I normally do things or how the world does things. I want to know what you would do in every situation, and I want the grace to follow you because I want the life that only you can give me. Amen? Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20 tell us how foolish and completely ridiculous the world's ways are. And if you don't already know that, let's just take a look at it and remind ourselves. For it is written, I will baffer, baffle and render useless and destroy the learning of the learned, the philosophy of the philosophers, the cleverness of the clever, the discernment of the discerning. I will frustrate and nullify them and bring them to nothing. Where is the wise man, the philosopher? Where is the scribe, the scholar? Where is the investigator, the logician, the debater of this present time and age? 
Has not God shown up the nonsense and the folly of this world's wisdom? Now, I think that if you can't look around today and see that man's ways don't work, then you're just not looking. I mean, there is so many totally, completely, unbelievably ridiculous things that go on in our world and governments and societies and people's lives today. And God has already told us that's not going to work. But we keep trying to do it the way of the flesh, the way of man, and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Honestly, and I don't necessarily, well, I don't say this out of any kind of pride at all, but I think I could sit down with a lot of those people and I could solve a whole lot of the world's problems in about five minutes. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't take a panel of experts, and you could too, because we have the wisdom of God. Now listen, here's the thing. As a born-again believer, you have options. You don't have to live off the top of your head. If you notice all the words he used there, he talked about philosophers and scholars and debaters and logical people who just live off the top of their head all the time. I don't care what we think about anything. It's what God says that matters because God will win out in the end. It's just like ignorance gone to seed out in the world today. It's just like, I, I just, I mean, I just, just, just unbelievable. Let's just think about a few things here. I've written down a page full of things, just kind of how the world looks at things and what the Word says about it. The world says, be greedy, save everything you can, look out for number one, which is yourself, of course, and maybe someday with any luck, you'll have something. Take care of yourself, because if you don't, nobody else will. The Word says, don't be greedy graspers. Give a portion of all that you gain away. Care about others. You don't even need to worry about yourself, because God will take care of you. <laughs> and you will also have peace and joy. You have options. Which one do you want, the world's way or God's way? Amen. Do you know how amazing it is to know what we know? We need to be praying for the world because just to know what we know is an unbelievably amazing blessing. So many people are living in complete darkness because they just don't have any knowledge. That's why I love to be able to do what I'm doing. And I'm grateful that I am on a lot of television around the world because everybody's not going to church, but everybody watches TV. And I'll tell you, there's a, a whole bunch of you right now, you flipped this program on accidentally, and you're still sitting there with your mouth hanging open trying to figure out, what is she doing? Well, she's got a strange voice. What does she think she's doing? Boy, she's an in-your-face, loudmouth woman. Well, just listen. Just listen. Amen? Because you know what? I've got the life that many of you want. And I didn't get it playing games with the world. I started that way, but I found out that God's ways are much better. We need to make a choice to choose God. The world says push to be in first place. Be in competition. Don't let anything get ahead of you. Go ahead and compromise a little. It won't hurt anything. After all, everybody else does it. The Word says the first will be last. Don't try to push yourself forward, but wait to be brought forward by God. Avoid competition and comparison. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and at the right time, He will exalt you. Don't compromise at all. Be true to your heart. Keep a clean conscience, because it is the little foxes that spoil your life. Live a life of integrity, and God will reward you. Which option do you want? The Word. The world says compare yourself to other people, and then strive to be like them, and that way you'll be accepted. The Word says, be yourself, your unique self. You're an individual created by God for something special. Find out what is in you and do it. If people reject you, don't worry about them. They rejected Jesus too. One more. The world says, be jealous. Want what other people have. Fight to get it. The world has no peace, no joy. It's filled with strife. People in the world are full of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and even hatred. 
The Word says, don't be envious. Don't be jealous. God will take care of you. Stay out of strife at all costs. You limit your blessings from God if you don't. Forgive your enemies. Bless them. Pray for them. And above all, walk in love. Now, I've tried it both ways. And I can save you some time in your life. <laughs> I can save you some misery and some agony. I have tried all of these both ways, and I can tell you that God's ways is the only way that really works. It's the only thing that's going to really bring you the life that you want to have. Now, this world is not your home. It's not your home. You don't have to live off the top of your head. You can live out of your spirit. Let me tell you something that I've learned. I don't know how many of you still have possessions, things in your possession that God's told you to give away, but maybe this will help you go home and do a little inventory. <laughs> Anything that God puts his finger on and asks you to use it, to bring it into the kingdom and use it for somebody else's joy or to help somebody else, whether it's an item or some of your money or whatever, the, some of your time, whatever it might be. Once God puts his finger on something, it no longer belongs to you, not that it ever did anyway. But if God tells us to let go of something and we keep it, we will never enjoy it after that. You just won't. Because every time you look at it, first of all, you're going to feel convicted. I remember a rhinestone bracelet that I had. had it, the top of it, had, the rhinestones turned into a little bow. And I thought it was so cute. And this girl that traveled on the road with us admired it all the time. And I'm just thinking, I wish you'd stop liking it because <laughs> I, because I really want to keep it. And so it was ridiculous. Thank God this has been several years ago. But it was ridiculous what I went through. It was like, I told God, I said, she's a lot smaller than me. This ain't even going to stay on her wrist. <laughs> so then I, you know, did that conference, went on home. Next time I wore it, she, oh, that's such a great, that, that's so pretty. And so then I felt again, gave her the bracelet, and then, and I didn't have two more of those, and I wanted to keep it. <laughs> and then and this was, I said, to, it was silver. And I said, you know what? I think she wears gold. I don't think silver looks good on her. <laughs> So I took the thing home anyway. Well, finally I ended up, you know, God nagged at me so much that I finally gave it to her. And then I went into this thing that we do sometimes of telling her what a sacrifice it was. <laughs> now, I hope you really enjoy this because this is my favorite bracelet and, you know, I'm really going to miss it. So then every time I'd see her wear it, I would say something about, oh, that looks so good on you. Yeah, it's really nice. I really miss it. Well, one day she comes and she gives it back to me. <laughs> and she said, you know, I just really feel like God wants me to give this back to you. Well, I just thought, oh, Joyce, why did you not shut up? She gave it to you because you wouldn't quit murmuring about it. Now, I still have that bracelet in my drawer at home, and I keep it not because I wear it, but to remind me how totally dumb that was because here's what happened to me, honestly, and I don't know how to explain this any way to you except just to tell it to you. After that, every time I would go to put that bracelet on, I would look at it and think, I don't really like that. God actually can remove the joy of us having something or the desire to even want to use it if we don't do with it what God wants us to do. And if I would have given the thing to her with joy, then there's no telling us what God would have done for me because here's the thing, you never, 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 never outgive God. Come on, give him a big praise. I really don't like a life filled with regrets, and I've found out that the only way that I can live without those regrets is by really choosing to do the right thing at the right time. You know, we need to be living a kingdom-focused life and standing against the temptation to do it our way or the world's way. Let's do things God's way, not a way that's going to produce a lot of bad results.
I've just been wondering lately, what is it that makes a person want to leave the comfort and monotony of home to come someplace crazy like this and do a medical clinic? Well, let's ask the volunteer doctors and nurses who do it all the time. They look sad and get downhearted, and then they look at you, get make eye contact, and you smile, and they read that smile, and then they start smiling, and then the kids all run to you and they smile. When you really experience that, you just you would you're hooked. <laughs> So what do you think? It can't hurt to at least check it out, right? All you need to do is go to our website, JoyceMeyer.org. All the information is there for you. And just think, your adventure may begin today. How do we hold on to trusting God? How can I have faith in God when I don't know how to trust? Well, I've heard your questions on trust, and I want you to know that God cares for you. Everything around us is just falling apart. As you can see, things keep getting worse. I don't know what to do. Well, the good news is that God has given us some very solid answers that we can look to in His Word. My hope is that my newest book will help you discover a trust that is truly unshakable. Bestel nu vol blijdschap vertrouwen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl slash vertrouwen of bel 026 20 22 100. Een vervuld leven komt niet uit de hemel vallen, maar het is zeker mogelijk, zegt Joyce Meyer. En ze laat je graag zien hoe je dat kunt bereiken. Maak kennis met Joyce, met haar levensverhaal, met haar tips voor het dagelijks leven, met haar boeken en alle andere impulsen die je kunnen leiden naar een vervuld leven. Bestel gratis de informatiebroschure en bel 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure.